you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started Peace and love, party people in the place to be. This is the BKMC, Talib Kweli. How you feeling? This is the world's number one best podcast, People's Party. And I got my lovely and talented, funny and thought-provoking co-host, Jasmine Lee, in a place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? <laughs> Just fixing my grandmother's pearls. You look like you're ready for business. I am ready for business. I'm motivated. Like you got on your business socks. Yeah. Socks, these <laughs> they're boots. <laughs> but I'm 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 here for business. I'm motivated and ready to go. We are here for business today as well, and we are here for art and we are here for culture and we are here to have fun, have a good time. And today's guest exemplifies all of those things. Our guest today is a truly prolific DJ and human being. He is a Grammy-nominated multi-platinum record producer, a songwriter, a singer. Man, what do this man don't do? He has <laughs> sold over 75 million records. These are huge numbers. He cut his teeth in hip-hop, producing, DJing, but he's going on to do so much more. Uh, he is an author, just like myself. He has a book called How to Win Big in the Music Business, which he just told me is a Trojan horse. We're going to get into that. He is a longtime radio host of the classic Smash Time Radio. Radio and Get Familiar Radio. In 2002, he was awarded the New Mixtape DJ Award at the Justo Mixtape Awards. Rest in peace to Justo. He was named DJ of the Year at the Mix Show Power Summit. Mix Show Power Summit has a huge impact on my career as well. Shout out to Renee and DJ Enough. He has also served as a correspondent for E! For the Daily 10, for E! News. He produces. He has produced records with Lady Gaga, Pitbull, Akon. These are some of the biggest artists of our generation Ludacris, to change the game snoop dogg fat joe ty dollar side kanye west jim jones a marie ashanti destiny's child big shot and the biggest of them all talib kwali <laughs> <laughs> he releases his own albums he's the co-founder of the invaluable mixtape a database mix unit, one of the biggest databases of mixtapes on the entire internet. He has a legendary run of mixtapes, including mixtapes with people like Eminem, people like Busta Rhymes, and people like Tyler Kweli. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the Smash Squad himself, Clinton Sparks in the place. Woo! Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Oh, he bought gifts. I brought gifts. Are you? Are you bearing gifts? I brought gifts. I brought gifts to my good friend, Kwali. What is it. this? By the way, that was one of the biggest intros I've ever heard. Do we have time to talk? We have it was time so to long. Let's go. All right. You know what I'm saying? Here, we let's, do this. Uh, let's open this. This is, is from my, my, I own the fastest growing esports and gaming lifestyle brand. It's called Xset. I heard that. And this is a gift. We can talk about that. Okay. But here's some gifts for you inside. Wow. Thank you, brother. See, th see now, what y'all got to understand is that me and Clinton Sparks are actually friends. Known this guy for a long time. He is over he, twenty years. He has been a, a very big supporter of my career. Oh, I got the book. I got the physical book. How to an, win an big. An extra for a friend in the music business. What, what about an extra for me? That's the friend. <laughs> That's the extra. I got one for you. Right. There's two hosts here. Right. This is this is. So as he's perusing through that bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will uh, talk about how me and Quelly first met in my mom's basement in 1999 or yeah. 2000. He was one of the first artists, and the reason I was able to get him to my house is because that was when the internet started to pick up. Uh -huh. And I knew that the record industry wasn't that familiar or hip to how the internet was working. So I lied to the music industry and said, I have the most cracking online radio show. Uh, you'd be doing your artists a disservice uh -huh. if you don't bring them to my mom's house. I had Eminem, <laughs> Wu-Tang, Cameron, Quelly, Common, Gilly, who was a major figure back then. Uh, everybody would come to my mom's All house. We would hang out, freestyle, and just kick it. That's awesome. Man, Clint Sparks has been doing this forever. And um, it was a time where you could, not, you could not go through Boston without making sure that you checked in. I just appreciate you so much. I uh, appreciate what you've done with me and for me. And um, I appreciate the way that you represent Boston. Thank Shout you. out to everybody who represents Boston well, like New Edition and of course, Mike Mark Wibbins, Wahlberg. Ricky. And, yeah. Dropkick Murphys, Mark, who Mark you also yeah. worked with. Yeah, of course. Yeah. This is why we somebody from Can't Boston. Can't the new kids on the block. <laughs> right? Can't forget the new kids hey, on the block. Hey man, hanging tough. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. You know it. Can you do the dance though? It's like something like. Really you gotta some, do it out the chair. Yeah, what are you doing? Like, oh, you, you can't oh, do it. Oh. All right, we'll, let, we'll, we'll do it another time. <laughs> he's like, I got the uh, uh, oh, oh, I got that part. Yeah, he's got the right stuff. I got the right stuff. That's what he's got. Now, you're. Wait, I got a question before you ask me anything. Yes. So on on. On 
Instagram mm -hmm. within the past year, mm -hmm. you were DJing live. Yeah, right? in the pandemic. And, and I and I noticed that. At first I was like, what the hell? Quali's DJing? That's my first thought. <laughs> Then my, my <laughs> okay. then, uh, then, I, I, then I see, I think I said something in the comments and then you said, shout out to Clint Sparks, one of my favorite human beings. And I, and I felt special inside. Did you? I was like, that was a really nice thing to say while you were DJing. Oh man. But then I've heard you say about a hundred other people, your I favorite people too. I was about to say too. that. <laughs> and that I don't feel so special anymore. I do have, that's why I said one of. He's a Libra. But usually we say one of, it's like one of a couple. One of, None of hundreds. It I don't have really hundreds, have but I do have a lot of quality. favorite human this beings. This is the thing, though. He knows a lot of people. Yeah. He travels a lot of places. So even if it is hundreds, that's still a little <laughs> bit of people in it, his life. Well, that's a fact. Maybe you should come up with different terminology for favorite to the best to something that distinguishes... Uh, He's in the fringe. He's a little bit closer. <laughs> nah, this is my motherfucker. <laughs> this is my motherfucking man right here. Um, okay, I'm going to think of a new qualifier for you right. by the end of this episode. Right. <laughs> my bestest bud. You no, know, but it's funny because we text often. And, and, and for years, from the first time we became friends till today, you say buddy and pal in the text message. Yeah. It's you know, kind of your thing. You know what's funny is... Early on in my hip hop career, mm -hmm. um, people would shit on me all the time for that. Like, man, this fucking buddy shit. Like, hey, buddy. Yeah, hey, like, pal. You no, know, because you have to be super hard. Right. You know what I mean? So you can't, like, say, what's up, pal? Or what's up, friend, pal? Or, what's up, buddy? Like, I literally respond, like, you'll hit me or anybody, be like, yo, Sparks, da, da, da. which, by the way, Quelly never calls me Clinton or Sparks. It's always Clinton Sparks. Well, that's right. Yeah, right? it goes together. <laughs> yeah, it does. Right. And I'm like, dude, it's you like know a trap request. You, you got to say, say the whole thing. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah. uh, people would be like, Yo, what up? I need this or whatever. And I always just responded with hi, H I. Right. And people would always find that weird or like always comment on right. it when it's like it's part of the English language. What's what's wrong with saying hi? That's right. Or buddy. You know, obviously you've done so many other things besides hip hop, but you your foundation is hip hop. Mm -hmm. So early Boston hip hop from Ed OG to Guru to even RSO, like describe what the early Boston hip hop scene was like. Um it was very underground. You know mm -hmm. the Middle East. Yeah, the Middle East party. is a classic club. Yeah, so Middle East was a, a place where a lot of underground artists would die. Eminem, mm -hmm. you, Calm, everybody would go there. And all the other local Boston artists mm -hmm. would try to go there and open up. Uh, 88.9 WERS was mm -hmm. like, it's how I started my career because uh, that was the hip-hop station in Boston. If you weren't getting played on there, then you didn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, so, And I would keep pushing my music to them. Uh, and they would always be like, nah, this ain't it. I make another record, nah, this ain't it. Then I finally listened to this dude and I was like, what gets him excited? Like when he's listening or playing music. So I noticed the kind of hip hop he liked. So I went back and made a record that kind of had those elements in the beginning. And then he was like, oh yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> so then, then he played that record mm -hmm. and then as he started, then I became cool with him. Then I, I was able to come back around with the records I thought were dope. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that was just a little, that right there is just a little tip for how to get into something that mm -hmm. you're not getting in. But yeah. Real quick, free game. Yeah, the, um, there's a lot more I'm going to say that every time you do a that. A lot more of that, where that came from in this right. book right here. Free game. Get familiar. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was a big underground scene, 7L and Esoteric. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, acrobatic. Mm. You know, there was a lot of uh, Mr. Liff, all those guys. Yeah, man. yeah so, and then uh, I, I, I think, I think it's fair to say that I am probably the guy that helped to bring it from just being underground to being recognized for being more than just underground in Boston mm -hmm. because I left. And because, as you said, like when you go to Boston, people be like, yo, you, oh, you know my man, Clint Sparks? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it kind of turned into that. So when I would start kind of being me, which is a little bit more mainstream than, than underground, because I wasn't a straight underground guy. And me merging the two together, even though I had the respect there and would still do those shows, I still had, and I don't know if you recognize this too, I still had more of like, I wasn't as underground as y'all. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I still had pop in my veins. So when I would yeah. be on radio and I'd play a you, but then I would play something that wouldn't make sense next to you. I was the guy that always took things like I put hip hop and EDM together before anybody was doing that or electro or even like underground and mainstream and mixtapes and stuff. And it ended up becoming normal and everybody was doing it. But when I would start, I always got pushed back and people would get angry. And then even when I would try to make my own sound in Boston, people would say, ah, he's whack. Until like, here's, I'm going to break down what every single rapper from a local city has to go through to break out. You go first, you're all in the same gang, right? 
And then everyone's like, oh, you're all looking out for each other. Yo, you're doing dope shit, da da da. Y'all doing shows together. Yo, I see you. Then you start doing a little bit better, and then there's a little bit of hate. Then you do a little bit better than that. Then those people are like, yo, you should look out. You should try to put me on. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. you're still trying to stay afloat. They don't, they think because you're a little bit higher that you can do favors for them, but you can't. Then when you get a little bit higher, then they start hating on you because they feel like you owe them right? Then when you start getting even higher, then they're like, fuck that dude. He doesn't look out for our city. He doesn't put nobody on. Meanwhile, you're still trying to put yourself on, but because you're at a status that's greater than theirs, they think you're in a position to put them on. Then when you, it takes you to leave your city and be praised outside of your city, now your city starts to represent you. It's like, oh yeah, he's from here. And it's like, yeah. damn, man, like you used to fucking say I was an asshole because I didn't play your whack shit on the radio. Now you want to act like we're fucking boys because we're both from the same town. Mm -hmm. And then they want you to look out for them. Did you ever have to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think on the level that you did. But yeah, I mean, certainly, absolutely. And, and with rappers, it's, you know, rappers will make a record about you. <laughs> you yeah, like, so you had rappers that were mad that you weren't looking out for them or helping put them on. Yeah, a couple Especially early on, mm -hmm. like the raucous days, there had to have been local dudes that are like, Yo, not really, you're not it. really people from the raucous era. People from like maybe before then, you know what I'm saying? Like before people then. from before the raucous era, like raucous era, like you're official now. Yeah, we were. It was a real, it was a real art community right. from that. But like maybe some local rappers, some little thing. I see things on like Facebook and MySpace back in the day. I would see things like, oh, I used to rap with that guy on when I, when I grew up on Avenue K. Let me see what he's talking about. Oh, he got a diss song about me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. But you also coming up, I mean, you didn't come up, you didn't come up rich. You didn't come up with a silver spoon in your mouth. Um, rest in peace to Bismarcky. He had a, a lyric that was famous talking about what people who trying to break in this business and how hard it is. Like, nigga, please, you work for UPS. Mm -hmm. You actually work for UPS. Mm -hmm. You know, you had run-ins with the law. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your experience growing up in Boston, uh, dealing with all of that. Yeah, you know, it's funny that no one really talks about, asks me that or knows that. You know, my father was an alcoholic and then left us, single mother. Um, we were broke, you know, roaches and food stamps, you know, kind of typical shit when you're fucking from the hood and then you know was bullied a lot didn't fit in had like bobo no name clothes and shit like that and then um started getting into crime a lot when i was young at 10 so i would like uh steal cars and rob houses and stick people up and do all that kind of shit but i always did it by my lonely I never, I never got anybody involved. No codies. Like, nah. At 10 years old was the beginning. And I, I broke into a dead man's apartment. I knew there was a dead guy in that apartment and I broke and I stole batteries from my Galaga game. Remember, like, it's a 10 year old thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And I remember yeah. when someone scared me, I was like, oh, his spirit's going to come back and get you. And I threw the batteries out my window. Man, when I was like 11, <laughs> my, my best friend I was hanging out with broke into my house and stole the Sega. What? And that's it. Yeah. Just a Sega. I had good friends that robbed my house too. Yeah. Um, okay, but I want to know is how did you know the dead man was in the house? Because the whole building smelled. Mm. And it smelled like a dead body. Mm. And I kind of knew that guy and he looked like someone that was going to die. Mm. So I was just like, I think that dude's dead. Mm. So I broke in. But, you know, to even understand like that mentality or even becoming a criminal, you have to like even go back and understand the kind of life somebody lived, right? To understand, mm -hmm. I lived 10 lives by the time I was 18. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? From And by the way, speaking of like when I was young, my mom would have like a les lesbians live with us. So I have like uh, cross dressers live with us or gay dudes live with us. So like, and then like I was always like the white kid around black kids and Latino kids and like, so like everything was already normal to me mm -hmm. as a kid. So I was exposed to so much the world had to offer that as I got older, it wasn't like, what's that? Or who are those? Or I don't understand that. I understood it all. So I think that's what made me, help me navigate to, through business, which I did through the music industry. I always approached my music with a business mentality, which is why Clinton Sparks' Get Familiar mm -hmm. was me branding myself from 2020 when nobody was branding themselves. And people would laugh at me when I was like, I'm a brand. Mm -hmm. Now everyone's a brand. But mm -hmm. 20 years ago when I'm like, nah, I'm a brand, that's why. And they're like, you ain't no brand, bro. You a DJ. And I would get that for like a decade before mm -hmm. people started catching on. Yeah, I mean, you, you're very intentional about that, that you're an entrepreneur and that you're, you're, you are into marketing and branding and this is what you're, that's what you do. And that the DJ is a, is a pathway to cool to earn 
currency and get eyes and get people fam- familiar with what you're doing. You've been very uh, well. I didn't even want that. I didn't even want to be a DJ. I, I wasn't. I didn't even think I was a DJ, but um, I was a rapper, you know, back then, and a dancer and a producer. And I really wanted to be the guy behind the scenes that made other people dope. Uh, but I kept doing that and putting my own money into it, pressing up records, getting features from people with local rappers, and then they would never respect appreciate or understand i'm like now we got to do this and then this because look at that point i'm them they're me so why the fuck would i know more than them in their Mm -hmm. mind and i'm a white dude Mm -hmm. so they're just like what the fuck does this white dude know about doing this this and that and so it would always end up like all right well i'm just gonna go do my own thing and then one time my girl and my friend at the time was like yo no one understands what you're trying to do why don't you just focus on yourself and that was the day I became Clinton Sparks, the DJ producer. Right. And the reason I became a DJ is because there was a local DJ in Boston that I used to hang around with because I would make remixes and I'd go get drops from people like you and, and make intros for him. So his show would be doper. And I would be in the office listening to him talk to record executives who would be pressing him to play their music. And he'd be like, yo, my boy Clinton made a remix to your song. And I would hear them be like, yeah, yeah, cool. Hey, what's up with my record? So I was like, oh, so if I become a DJ, they'll be on my nuts <laughs> rather than me trying to be on their nuts because right. they'll need me to play their shit. And at the very least, they'll give me a courtesy listen because I have right. something to offer them. So that's when I decided that day I'm going to be a DJ. And I, the, my very first show was a 10 city syndicated show. And then I built my own Clinton Sparks Get Familiar show, Smash Time Radio, as you mentioned, in 22 markets around the world. Yeah, and from that you went on to be produced and for great big huge artists and sing, and you uh, sang. Oh, so you have this record. Shout out to Snoop Dogg. Um, you have this record, The Reaper. Mm-hmm. Have a lyric. I'm just a son with no father. Mm-hmm. You talked about your father being an alcoholic. And are you trying to make me cry on this show, Talib Kweli? No, nah, you know, but you know, we're definitely trying to create a safe space for yeah, you to, right. to to tell your story. Um, you have a very complicated relationship with your father. Mm-hmm. And I've heard you talk about how it informs who you are today. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to give you a chance to share some of that, your father being a Vietnam vet and the ups and downs and the sort of roller coaster relationship you have with your father. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a relationship mm-hmm. today. Um so when I was 15, because of the crime, my mom kept having to get me out of, out of jail. Um, she was like, that's it. I'm sending you to your father in the suburbs. I lived in the city. So I'm like, I'm not moving to the fucking boondocks with the hicks and that. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when you're from the city, that's what you think back then. So I ended up having to go live with him in a suburb of Boston. And there's one, a, a, thing, a line he would say to me all the time that used to upset me. By the way, when I went to go live with him, it was the greatest thing because my father's a very like man's man, right? Mm-hmm. So it was like, I was just, he didn't tell me how to be a man, but I would just watch him and I'd start. Sylvester Stallone prior to him was the guy I looked at as how to be a man, right? So when I watched like him and Bruce Willis and those kind of guys on TV, I'm like, oh, that's what a man's supposed to be. Keep people honest, do the right thing, mm-hmm. fight for what's right, care about your family. So that's why I'm that guy today because I thought that's what a real man is mm-hmm. from watching them. So then- when I'm with my dad, he would always say things when I'd still get in trouble at school, like suspended or whatnot. He'd be like, I didn't raise you that way. And, um, you know, at that time at 16, I didn't say, I'm just like, you know, dad, could you do me a favor and just like not say you didn't raise me that way because you didn't, you didn't raise me. And he would be like, well, who, do you, who do you think's raising you? And like, at first, I was a little bit too timid to go at my dad about it. But then fast forward to 18, we had the kind of big father-son fight that a lot of fathers and sons have, at least in our era. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember yelling at him saying, I'm going to be a way fucking better father than you when I grow up. And he was like, yeah, you'll see fucking shit happens and life happens. Da, da, da. I was like, fuck you, fuck you. And I never talked to him again. I walked to the door and I didn't talk to my dad for years. And I didn't think I talked to him ever. And then I think I was like 21. And I thought back to what happened to my father as a kid that affected him to not allow him to be the father I needed him to be. And when I did research and seen the horrible past he had, uh, which, you know, that's his story to tell, but the things I can't say, his father used to beat the shit out of him and then he had issues with his mother and then Vietnam and then like, who the fuck can imagine Vietnam? You know what I mean? So when I realized all the trauma that he's been exposed to, my resentment turned into empathy. 
And in that moment, I feel like I learned one of the keys to life. Um, So I went back to my father and um, I forgave him. (laughs) And, um, And then we became best friends. Yeah for you know like 20 years and then uh, like everything like you couldn't find a better son than me not to toot my own horn but like i'm a dope ass son mm-hmm. right and uh then i watched the michael jackson documentary and i was sexually abused as a kid for many years and i never thought about it never needed therapy over it. it's not something that like i'm it's a problem for my life mm-hmm. and i watched that documentary and despite what you think about you know, uh, Michael Jackson, the things the dudes were saying yeah. that are my age, you would have had to have gone through that shit to say that shit. So it affected me. And it, like, I had to stop it three times because I never cry over this. And I was crying because I'd never heard another dude my age talk about what they went through and how it affected them. And so I called my dad after the, I think it was like a two-part series. And I called my dad after the first one and I was sharing it with him. And my dad has experience with this. You know, I've always had trouble as an adult with my relationship with my mom. Cause as I see it, it was on her watch. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and it was, it was her boyfriend mm. in our house. And it's like, how the fuck could you not know that was happening? Right? So, you know, those are questions that you'll never get answered. So I stopped asking. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I called him after the second episode because then those kids were talking about their difficult ways. Like, I have no feelings for my mom. And I was like, holy fuck, I never heard anyone talk about this before. Mm-hmm. So I called my dad and we go to talk. He answered the phone, what's up, Clinton? And that's something's wrong with my dad voice. Right. And I go, what's wrong, dad? He goes, you know, I'm so fucking sick of being between you and your mother and sister. And I go, what are you even talking about? And he goes, why the fuck do you have to talk about being molested on the internet? Pause. Three weeks earlier, I realized a song that I wrote and produced had 55 million streams on Spotify. And I didn't know. And the song that I wrote it for, an anti-bullying campaign. And I didn't realize how successful the record was. Wow. And I found out. So I had made a post saying, as a kid, I was sexually abused, which is probably the first time I said that to the public. But here's how you turn a bad thing into a good thing. I didn't throw anybody under the bus. I didn't talk about any details. I talked about how I took that pain and turned into a song that had this much success. So it just so happened, my mother and sister seen that post that day. Mm. So me talking to my dad and that all happening at the same time, mm-hmm. coincidentally, lot, yeah. looked like this, all this shit is happening. So, you know, me and my father got into an argument and, you know, we just, it was a little bit more, but it's a long story. And, and just, we just, he literally sent, he broke up with me by text. Mm. And he's just like, yeah, you know, I, I just can't have you in my life anymore and respect my decision. So I never even responded. But to your question is, um, people are born with different tools, man. Like we have different tools in our toolbox and we know how to build and fix things differently than, than other people. So I can't expect you to receive something or get past something or understand or comprehend something the same way that I would. So I understand that my dad's a very broken guy. Mm-hmm. And I understand he doesn't have the tools that I have to equip himself yeah. to get past those things and understand the loving son that you already left once that gave you a second chance to be in his life and you left him again. I would never leave my kids. In fact, when my marriage, my marriage was kind of failing, mm-hmm. two things I always wanted to be since I was a kid, no Grammys, no being rich, none of that stuff. Only two things I ever cared about, making people happy, and being an awesome dad. Those are the only two things I cared about since I was 10. Uh, And uh, one day when I was traveling, because you know how it is when we travel doing what we're doing, Mm -hmm. I asked my son, I said, hey man, I'm coming home Thursday. He goes, yay, dad, coming home. And I'm like, dude, we're gonna do this. We're gonna build a house. We're gonna have a sleepover. We're gonna watch movies. And then I go, hey man, what do you miss most about me when I'm gone? Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know, dad, man, you just make everything happy. So in that moment, my two goals were met. And then real quick, in addition to my dad that I left out, after that big fight that we had when we made up and I had my son, Jack, a few years after he was born, me and him went out to dinner. So we're driving home, my father's driving and he starts to pull over. And I go, what are you pulling over for? And he goes, I got to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Like you can't fucking talk and drive, right? Right. And he's like, "Uh, no, it's important. So I'm like, 
this guy going to tell me he's got cancer or something? Mm. So he like pulls over um, and he stops and he kind of like looks up. And I, I mean, my dad's going to get upset. He like looks up in the air. I'm like, what are you about to tell me? So he looks at me. And remember when I said at 18, I'm going to be a way better father than mm-hmm. you. This is fucking 10 years later. Um, he looks at me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, I just want to tell you, you're a better father than I am. Wow. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah, it was. It was a really powerful moment. And I'm doing my best to hold back the tears, Quali. Well, I really appreciate you feeling safe enough to share a lot of that with us. Yeah. You know, hopefully other people that have tough situations can make attempts. One, understand that other people have issues and problems that they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to live with it. They don't know how to accept. Like, I think my fa- my father's problem is, because I realized, because he was he's a reformed alcoholic, well, he's an alcoholic, right? Mm-hmm. But he's a bartender at a mm-hmm. VFW. And I used to think, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. But then I realized he needs to feel needed mm-hmm. and wanted. And all the people there are like, man, George, what a great guy you are. They're like, mm-hmm. that's what he needs to feel alive. I don't need that from him. And I think that because I don't need anything from him, it's intimidating and problematic. And I don't, it bothers him that his son has become a better man than he is. Hmm. I appreciate you being so honest about the need to examine these relationships and how they impact us Mm. and being honest about the abuse, the sexual abuse. Uh, We don't talk about these things enough. And I think that you empower people who are going through it when you are honest and share with us. Well, On your own time, of course. Right. Well, it makes somebody not feel as ugly or Mm -hmm. alone or like, you know, because it's a weird thing to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Because now it's way more open. When we were coming up, like I would never, even coming up, I never talked about me being a criminal, Mm -hmm. which I probably could have got stripes Mm -hmm. coming up in hip hop. Like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I used to do this. I used to do that. But I didn't, I never thought that was fucking cool. Mm -hmm. I literally did it to survive. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to fucking be cool. And that's why I did it alone. I didn't even tell motherfuckers I was doing this shit. Mm -hmm. They're just like, yo, how do you have like my mom? Mm-hmm. Or whatever it is. Because I wasn't proud. And I yeah. didn't want some kid to say, well, look at Clinton Sparks. He's doing well and he was a fuck up. What's interesting about your situation with your father for me and you being a white person in hip hop is the myth of fatherlessness being a mostly or even exclusively black thing is is very pervasive and it's something that is pushed all the time, despite what the numbers say. And um, I think your story exemplifies that. Mm. You know, and and I think that uh, it's just very interesting to me, your your very unique position in hip hop. I agree. I think there's, you know, obviously there's other white guys Mm -hmm. and there's other people. But I think that, to your point, I think that I found my unique path. And Mm -hmm. and despite all those things happen to me, the reason why I have such an incredible life now, Mm -hmm. I mean, I've built as perfect of a life that I feel I could ever build. Mm -hmm. And I, because I built it by design, Mm -hmm. not by circumstance. And the problem with most people not being able to find their happiness Mm -hmm. is because they allow the circumstances of their life to dictate where they're going to end up or how they're going to live. Right. So I built it by design. And it's easy to build it by design when you you pay attention to the world, when you listen. The answers are all there. People just don't listen. Right. Right. Whether it's your girl telling you, like, I don't like this about you. Whether you see your parent doing something wrong. People are protesting. People will give you the answers that you need to become better. You just have to care enough to listen. <clears throat> what was your experience like hosting Smash Time Radio in Boston? Uh, it was great. It was exciting. I was uh, able to bring a lot of artists like Talib Kweli up there. A lot of you guys might not know this, but Talib Kweli wasn't accepted in mainstream. <laughs> and I, and like, I'm, I was the guy that would be on the top 40 stations playing the blast and playing all these yeah, records. That's- and, All true and, story. And and every even my PDs at radio stations were like, what is that shit? I was like, it's mm-hmm. fucking dope. That's what it is. That's all you need to know. It was a really great thing to know or feel that my continuous push of it, underground rappers like Quali mm-hmm. eventually started getting them on mixed show lists, eventually started getting them added to rotation. And I know for a fact I played a major role in helping to push 
other people, underground artists into those spaces, even on E! News. Like, mm -hmm. when I got there, it was literally Britney Spears, Paris Hilton. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm the one that brought, like, Pharrell and Little John and you and Pusha and would mention all these names on there because I understand. Because, back to my point of living 10 lives before I was 18, I would understand the concept of 50 Cent thinking the lifestyle of Paris Hilton is cool as fuck, mm -hmm. but doesn't know how to talk to her. Mm -hmm. And I would understand that Paris Hilton thinks 50 is fucking mysterious and cool and dangerous, and they don't know how to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And like, I would be the guy that would bring these worlds together. Like, and it goes back even in school, even in the cafeteria, I'd go sit with the white kids, the black kids, the Asian kids, the kids that downstairs, you don't even know what they do all day until you see them at lunch, right? And like, <laughs> I'm the guy that would like, that they're in gym half the day. Like, what, what kind of life is that? Right. Uh, so like, I would go sit at all of those tables. And early on, I realized, fuck, everyone's the same. They just listen to different music or wear different clothes, but he likes that game mm -hmm. or he has that problem at home. And I'd be the guy that would go to every table like, oh, dude, the connector. you should know him. Mm -hmm. And you know me for that even in this business. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy even in the music business like, yo, Puff, you should do this. Mm -hmm. Yo, Swizz, you should, yo, Snoop. Like, even you. You connected me with Static Selector for the first time. Bro, I brought you to your first rock concert. Yeah, that's right. I brought you to Motley Crue. That's right. We <laughs> went We went to see Motley Crue, and I saw Tommy Lee play Simon Says Upside Down, <laughs> and I was the only black dude there. I was the fly boy in the buttermilk, as they say. <laughs> it was a good time. Can you break down the eclectic Boston mix of white, black, Irish influence, racism versus their appreciation of hip-hop? Yeah, so... It was very, when I was young in the 80s, um, it was very, very segregated. Roxbury, Mattapan was black. Um, South Boston, definitely white. Like when you were white, you couldn't walk through Roxbury safely. When you were black, you couldn't walk through South Boston safely. Um, Dorchester was half and half. I'm from Dorchester. The white part of Dorchester, you had an alcoholic father and were probably molested. Like that was a normal upbringing mm. in my life. And then the other half, was like I lived in the black neighborhood, but I went to a white school. So I had understood like all these worlds. But yeah, racism was very uh, real as mm -hmm. when I was young. My, my grandmother was a straight racist like mm -hmm. at first. And I got her to understand. And like, you know, she would, at the time, I didn't realize how bad these words were because I'm mm -hmm. a kid, but it, it didn't sound right, right. Right. And then I'd hear her say things and I'd start getting all like, whoa, man, I don't think you should be saying shit like that. Mm -hmm. And then all my friends were black. Right, so I couldn't go by Nana's house with my friends because she was didn't accept that, and right. I was like, "Fuck that!" And I started doing it, and then she met my friend Kevin, and then after a while, she's like, "I like your colored friend Kevin." I was like, "It's not a <laughs> colored friend; he's my friend. Right? That's he's my friend, Nana." Right? <laughs> and then, uh, then she'd meet another another friend of mine, then another friend, then another friend. Then she literally went from being straight, like racist, mm -hmm. to like. Not at all anymore by the mm -hmm. time she died. My sister had a baby with a black man and like, it was like- Now a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. I don't like those apples. Uh, I think, you know, because of how many worlds I lived in and because I understood and because nothing was weird or different, um, mm -hmm. like I just understood and accepted and respected every culture. I didn't see- sex, color, race, religion. I just mm -hmm. seen, are you a dick or are you not? Mm -hmm. That's all I ever gauged in my entire life. Would I fuck with you if you're an asshole or if you're just a good dude? Yes, yes, yes. Mix unit, man. Mix unit was so big or so big and so important. Once again, rest in peace, Justo and yeah. Mixtape Awards was so important. But um, mm -hmm. tell me about the creation of Mix Unit. You know, being a mixtape DJ, um, building a big mixtape following and starting to like really like smash the streets. It was like, what do we so what the real the real way that was built because me and my partner Mike Rios if you mm -hmm. know Mike so I was dealing with a bunch of dudes that didn't understand how to run business mm -hmm. with all the mixtape sites which you probably remember too it's mm -hmm. just it was super whack. And I'm like, man, you ain't paying me on time. Or, yo, you ain't responding to me when I got to put this mixtape mm -hmm. out. It was just problematic. It was just ran from all dudes in the hood that didn't really know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. So as I kept complaining about it, uh, which is what I still do to this day, if there's a problem, then I'm just going to go fix it. Or I'm just going to mm -hmm. go do it. So Mike had brought this to my attention. Why don't we create a mixtape site? And I was like, yeah, we should. And this is how we'll run it. And we'll care about customer service and we'll care about doing right by the DJs and we'll care about promoting these artists that are on these mixtapes. Because prior to that, the mixtape sites were just like money makers. Right. Give me a mixtape. Here's $2 a mixtape. I sell them for 10. I make money. That's it. So we decided to build that and just become the mecca 
one-stop shop for all mixtapes. Mm -hmm. And Mix Unit was so big, it made $5 million its first year. Wow. And it was so big, it knocked a lot of the other mixtape sites like off the map. One being my boy Q, mm -hmm. who had a mixtape site. And he was like, yo, what should we, what am I going to do now? Fuck y'all, man. Like Mix Unit's so big, I can't do this shit no more. And I was like, bro, here's what you should do. You should be, a, you should aggregate all the videos of all the shit that goes on in the streets. Like all the club fights, all the fucking, all the just debauchery that goes mm -hmm. on in the hood and in the streets and put it on one website. Every fucking white kid in the world will watch that website. And then that was World Star Hip Hop. Oh, so this is your fault. Yeah. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. Uh, so, yeah, so Q. Rest in peace to Q. Yeah, rest in peace to Q. He's fucking so dope. And like the year leading up to his unfortunate, untimely passing, he was coming to my apartment regularly because I was like, let's step it up, man. Like, let's start World Star Films where we start going to get black directors and screenwriters from the hood, mm -hmm. fund their shit, and then upstream it. Started at World Star and upstream it. Then we got in touch with Puff, upstream mm -hmm. it to Revolt. We're starting that distribution. I was like, why don't we start a festival? Like what Rolling Loud is now. So Q was like totally into doing all these mm -hmm. things. And we were getting ready to, to start doing all this to the point that, Q literally said to me the last time he was at my apartment before he passed, yo, Sparks, how much, how much equity do you want in Worldstar? And I was like, and I never expected, wasn't looking for that at all. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, you don't have to give me any equity. He's like, nah, you've been here since the beginning and you're still here trying to help me and you always have my back. Like, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. But like, just to show his heart, how like he was so giving and caring that I didn't ask for it. Mm -hmm. He didn't need to give it to me. But the fact that he was like, let me give you a piece of world star, you know what I mean? And then obviously that didn't pan, none of the things we mm. talked about panned out, but yeah, Q was a great dude, man. Yeah. By the way, those are air buds from Ray J. Oh, okay. I was going to, I was going to ask that, but thank you for, for letting me know. Those um, are Ray J's air, uh, oh. Raycon air buds. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I heard that you had one wish, so I brought you some. <laughs> I did have one wish. <laughs> All right. So how did you like link up with FaZe Clan? Uh, so how I got down with FaZe Clan and helped build that company to be as big as it became is my buddy, uh, Greg Selko, who was the owner and, and CEO of Karma Loop, which you remember. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had talked to him about coming over to FaZe to help build that brand. Um, at the time, they were just a bunch of popular kids online. They didn't have any business model, any mm -hmm. revenue drivers like that. So Greg calls me one day. At this time, I'm vice president of Dash Radio. And he calls me, he goes, I need you to come to this office real quick. We're going to do some dope new shit. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right. And I just headed over there. When I went over there, it was like boiler room. Just people like running around. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And he was like, dude, we're getting into the gaming space. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is that? At this time, I didn't know how big, I didn't know how big it was. Right. So I sat there and I, I paid attention and looked around, asked some questions. I was so confident in it within like two days, I invested $50,000 of my own money into it. Mm -hmm. And then, um. Then I, I, I took the brand and I said, man, this is like, this is a business that my brain has always has been waiting for because mm -hmm. my brain has always been too big for every industry I was around. People wouldn't get it. They wouldn't understand it. They're like, oh, you're crazy. Or like, we can't do that. And when I seen this space, I'm like, holy shit, there's no limits to what we can build here. And there's, and it's, it's for everybody, right. but everybody doesn't know about it. Right. right. So I was like, how can I intersect all of these cultures that I'm a part of that I, I know how to talk to and communicate with and intersect into this gaming space that's got billions of gamers around the world that, again, back to the 50 in Paris mm -hmm. concept, don't know about each other, don't know how to talk to each other, right. don't understand these opportunities out of here. Like, if, like, you don't, like when you're from the hood, you look at music or sports to get out of the hood, right? Gaming is the new way right. without dribbling a ball for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you can literally become your own entrepreneur and make hundreds of thousands of dollars gaming, mm -hmm. but no one's telling anybody in the streets this. Right. There's no narrative out there like, bro, do you know? Like we're just in barbershops and studios playing Xbox. We're talking talking shit for free. Yeah, just for free. Like there's so much money out there to make, but no one, so I wrote a whole op-ed about how gaming's the new hip hop. Right. And, and you can post it out there. But with FaZe, I, was, I brought Offset, Yo Gotti, DJ Paul, Troy Carter, like Ray J, mm -hmm. like all these people into this space, Big Boy. 
And like, trust me, for a whole like year and a half, I'm calling everybody, everybody we know. Right. From Busta to Switch. Like I'm telling, yo, you got to get in. This is next. Have I ever steered you wrong? Right. And like, nah, but I just don't get it. Or Raleigh, your, your sparks, my gaming <laughs> days are behind me. I'm like, bro, I'm not trying to make you Julian Ellum. I'm trying to make you Robert <laughs> fucking Kraft, bro. Like, let me teach you about right. this space that you can make a shit fucking ton of money that all these kids fucking love you. So I finally, Yo Gotti was the first person that got it. Shout out to Yo Gotti for getting it. Uh, he was the first person to invest and come over and really understand. I went to his house like three times to convince him how this is the next wave. And bro, like I'm always forecasting trends. I always know the next wave. And I'm not saying that to toot my horn. It's fucking giving a shit. It's paying attention to what's going on, what people care about, what they're talking about, looking down there, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I'm like, oh, this is like, even when I said earlier, when I started mixing hip hop and EDM, I remember going to Steve Aoki and like, yo, check this out. And he was like, damn, man, you're doing this. I look at you to see what's hot in hip hop. And I'm like, right. this is what's going to be next that's hot in hip hop, bro. And like, then it became that. Was Turn Down for what? One of the first EDM hip hop mixes? No, nah, like, that, was, that was years after. I feel like Turn Down for what? It has that's EDM what elements, noticed. but that's still a hip hop record, I feel like. It's well, ding, Snake ding, is hip hop. Ding, ding, ding. Snake yeah. is hip hop. And like, so to close out phase, because I'm sure you can ask me about Snake, when I started bringing all those worlds, and by the way, when I wanted to bring Offset there, I had an argument with the CEO for months about why this makes sense. He was like, we're not a, a music company. Why would we do that? And then even as I'm like convincing Offset, like why it's smart for you as an entrepreneur and it's a power play for you and it has all these other opportunities and starts adding levels to your portfolio, um, he understood. I'm talking about how we can integrate these worlds and how we can amplify your objectives and how we can build ancillary businesses around here in this space because now you'll have an authentic footprint in here. So he's excited about it. Mm -hmm. So when we sign him, we're supposed to do a big announcement about it. And then like, it's not happening. So his manager's hitting me like, what's going on? And now I'm always the voice and the guy that's fighting for us, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? For hip hop in corporate America and whatever it is and trying to convince people that don't get it why it's dope, right? And right. I've always been that guy. So even with gaming, I'm trying to convince them. And I remember getting a call and I've never said this. I don't usually like put negative things out there about, about people, but you're my man. Okay. And, and, and because like, you know, people have been trying, when I left phase, all the media has been like, why'd you leave? Why'd you leave? Cause I left. I'm like one of the top motherfuckers making that shit hot. And at the top, I just left. Mm -hmm. And it was like, why would you leave when they're arguably the biggest thing in the world? And honestly, if you see my resignation letter, the company would probably collapse if that ever got out public. Mm -hmm. But when I kept saying, we got to put out this press release, the CEO literally called me and said, we'll fucking put out the press release when we fucking feel like putting it out. We're fucking FaZe Clan. Tell Offset to fucking hold on. Whoa. And we might not even do it. And if we do do it, it'll be with a bunch of other rappers that we're going to sign, not him by himself. Mm. Literally, my jaw dropped. Mm. My heart fucking went cold. And I thought, oh my God, I don't want to be a part of this company. Right. And I started to walk into my kitchen to tell my wife, yeah, I ain't going to be a part of this anymore. And the CFO called me at the time. It's like, don't fucking listen to him. Fuck that dude. We're going to make this happen. Because like, I'm fighting mm. for my friends. Yeah. And then it got to a point where I won't get into all the reasons why I left, but it really started turning into like, y'all are using all my black rap friends to make yourself look dope right. and act like you're the most cultural youth brand out here mm -hmm. and don't even know how to speak to black people. Mm -hmm. You don't even know how to represent moments that show unity for the culture you're claiming that you're a part of. Mm -hmm. And I would constantly have these internal fights mm -hmm. with the people in there and they didn't even understand the value of me. You understand the value of me. It's more than just being a dope DJ. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I understand the value of you. This is more than just a rapper named Talib Kweli. Mm -hmm. You stand for something. You are a good human at heart. Sometimes I think you waste too much time arguing with people online. Yeah, people feel but, that way. But, but, I, but, I, but I know right. in your heart mm -hmm. that it's, it's with good intentions to try to enlighten yeah, other people. It's like, hey, man, that's kind of a dick way to think. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and I think that's what the underlying statement is. And when you go back and forth to people, it's not to say I'm right and you're wrong or you're an asshole right, right, and right. I'm not. It's more like, hey, here's another perspective that 
Maybe yeah, it might and, make you see it differently. And I say it, I say that when they come to me infringing on my perspective. Right. I'm not out there like on other people's pages, like, hey, right. you should think you this. You should think like this. Right. Yeah. Neither do I. Right. I never, even the way I raise my kid, it's never been like, be like this, do like that. Mm-hmm. I show them the options mm-hmm. and let him decide. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I left phase and then I started. Uh, I was like, why am I staying here doing all these incredible things, building this brand, bringing all the sauce mm-hmm. to a company that doesn't respect, doesn't appreciate, doesn't acknowledge the things that I've done here? To this day, they probably still wouldn't acknowledge it. But those that know, no. We went to start, me, Greg, and Will, who were at Exit, all part of Karma Loop as well. We we're like, yo, let's just go start Exit. We're bringing all the hot shit. Mm-hmm. Let's just go build a bigger, better version of what this is yeah. for the people. It's your idea. The people's anyway. party. Right. Yes, you know indeed. I mean? Because it's for everybody. Yeah. But it, it, it really felt like, and I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, it really felt like a white frat house. That's how everything is. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's literally America. Yes, that's America. how everything feels to us, Clay. Right, right. The whole world. <laughs> well, like, look, well so, so look, so right, right. I built my career off of black culture. Mm-hmm. Like, like diversity is in my DNA. Mm-hmm. I feel uncomfortable not being around diversity. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? So like whenever a white guy does say something to me where he's trying to size me up to see if I'm going to white up and say to some white, white up, shit. I like that. You know what I'm saying? Are you going to white up or what? No, but you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> to see if I'm going to say some like, yeah, I agree with that. No, I get it. I get you it. Said, you know what I mean? You're giving like, us insight right now. Need, it's like watching a Tarantino movie over here. The, well. these, <laughs> these are the white people that we need. Like, we need people to experience like, okay, this is the good boys. Even though it's not necessarily the good boys, a lot of those different groups are. Because when you think about gaming, I don't even see why you would have to convince somebody that gaming and hip-hop goes hand in hand totally. look at the music with gaming look at the dances that you have in Fortnite. like it's common sense that it's joint it's all a part of yeah, our what culture happens, what happens in, in anything including gaming is people aren't getting an invite to the party mm-hmm. right so when they don't get the invite they don't even think about going to the party right right so someone like perfect example there was a black kid named astonish from from atlanta his whole family was losing everything. Their house was going into foreclosure. They were like late on bills for like six months. He asked his mom to rent him a gaming console. A guy went on and won $150,000 on Fortnite and saved his family's life. Wow. wow. Those stories are not being Beautiful. told. Beautiful, yeah. They're not, you know what's being told? Oh, uh, he made it to the NBA. Mm-hmm. Do you mm-hmm. know how fucking hard that is? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yo, he got a platinum record, got a million dollar deal. No, the fuck he didn't. He didn't just get a million dollars cash. You and I both know it. Right. No one walks up to a rapper and says, has a million dollars cash, do as you like. It doesn't work like that. Right. But we're fooled and lied to because the internet lies to us all day. And it, it tries to infuriate us and it tries to make you think that way or feel bad about that thing. Or it makes every 19-year-old feel like they got to be a billionaire by the time they're 19 or they're a fucking loser. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And like, yeah. that's the internet that we live in now. And it's not fucking true. And I feel like when I speak, I want to speak like the big brother to everybody, to this whole generation. Like, stop. The first, one of the first lines in my book is I'm going to teach you how to do more dope shit and less whack shit mm-hmm. because we're all doing whack shit for, because we think that's what we're supposed to do. Think about how many people watching right now post something and now they're on this drug of like every 10 minutes. Did anybody like it? Mm-hmm. How many people are doing it? Like, from from their likes. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. Just do what you like. Mm-hmm. If it's something you like, the people that you care about or the people that will respond or that matter to liking that mm-hmm. will like it. So whether you're a gamer, you're, an, you're a rapper, you're an athlete, you're an entrepreneur, you're an artist, do what the fuck you like. Your audience is out there. Stop chasing somebody else's. I literally just said that. Today, someone was telling me to do this this Turkish ABC thing or whatever. And I'm like, that works for them. Right. When I woke up and I decided like, I'm just going to post when I want to post. Cause like, I used to like be looking up what the correct times to post the trends was. and the hashtags. Like, oh, I have to post at this time. I do this time. Now it's like, if I want to post it, I do. And if I don't, I don't. Some people are um, social media wizards, but that's just them. That's right. how they are supposed to make it. Well, that that's doesn't their mean life. that's how you're supposed to make it. You know why he would write raps every day? Cause he's a rapper. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, a a, I'm not a social media influencer. Exactly. So I'm not going to dedicate my life to doing it. Right. If you like the things that I do, perfect example. And this can, you can kind of like encompass this in like everybody that's chasing that. Like every rapper wants to be on Rap Caviar. Every person wants to get a million views. Every, they're all chasing the same exact goal. There's a million other ways to win. But you're just focused on that one way because you don't want to take the time to discover. Find your own niche. So everybody has their own superpower. The problem is... 
everybody is so focused on trying to have somebody else's superpower, they never take the time to discover their own, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So if, if I have a company and I'm like, oh, I wanna go get likes for my company, but all I do is post up ass, mm -hmm. ass shots, I'm gonna get a shit ton of horny dudes that like and look at my shit. Yeah. But that doesn't help my objective or the, the company that I'm trying to build. And now, so you, right. now you misled people. So you're using it wrong. When we um, did get familiar, first of all, I'm very proud of these mixtapes that we've done together. Uh, I did get familiar mixtape with you, the one that I did in between Liberation, which is a very important project for me. I'm doing Liberation 2 now. And Eardrum. And I got connected these things. Uh, levels on that record. I went back and revisited it recently and, yeah. and me and Styles P, that kind of cemented our relationship. We became a group after that. Mm -hmm. um, Bobby James, us doing that Bobby James, that was inspired. Mm -hmm. You shouted out Sal Masakellis, who then became Salema Masakellis, who was on the show. Did you see his episode? Yep. Yeah, so shout out to Salema. Yep. I'm very proud of Gang Mentality. Um, do you remember the first time you heard Atheon Crockett on that? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed. You know, we have a lot of history, man. Yeah. Even lot. more than I thought. Yeah. It, but you, it, you, there wasn't a, you did a freestyle for every mixtape I put out for like the first like five years of my career. Yeah. You know, you know I've done over a hundred mixtapes in my career. Wow. Over a hundred. I'm that's, not on a hundred of them. That's 10, that's a mixtape a month for mm -hmm. almost 10 years. And you know, my mixtapes, it wasn't just compilations where I just went and threw shit together. Right. I was making intricate intros, producing records, getting verses, repurposing verses, making new hooks out of songs. Me and Green Lantern are hands down the two most innovative, creative, original mixtape DJs in the history of mixtapes and hip hop. Yeah, Green is dope. Green is dope. I challenge somebody to argue that. I'll take the Pepsi challenge on... um. Remember I did the video for Night After Night, the Strong Arm Steady song featuring Kobe? Kobe was on that song? Uh, Kobe, the singer. Oh. Yeah. That's <laughs> Not the basketball player. Yeah, I was like, I was like, <laughs> like no, I don't remember Every other basketball that. player has rapped. <laughs> uh, no, but Kobe did rap. That's why I'm saying. He I don't did know, rap maybe, for a second. Um, we should, I got to find that video. It's just on the internet somewhere. But it's a video for the song we did on your mixtape. It's the only place that song is is on the mixtape. But shout out to DJs who are living their best life, like DJ Mighty Mai, who I enjoy going to Vegas and seeing him DJ mm -hmm. and yeah. doing those like sort of EDM uh, hip hop things that he does. Yep. And I feel like it's difficult for a hip hop guy like mm -hmm. that in Vegas. You know, and I feel like you kind of brought this hip hop energy to Vegas. Mm -hmm. Talk about the difference between the club music they play in hip hop in Vegas and hip -hop, and the hip hop they play in Vegas and your participation in helping to shift that scene. Yeah, so when I first, in 2007, I remember I went to Las Vegas and I was on the mic standing on the turntables mm -hmm. playing hip hop. Mm -hmm. And they were like, get this fucking guy off the mic, <laughs> get him down. And when we were done, by the way, the crowd loved it, mm -hmm. but of the manager did. did. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was, that was uncommon back then. P and people were on the mic, like Northeast DJs were on the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one like stood on turntables. Like I always performed as a DJ. Like I used records to talk shit and then respond and stuff like that. So he was like, you'll never have a place here in Vegas. Ooh. Vegas is not for you. So when I started becoming a host on E! News uh, with Sal, mm -hmm. um, Ben Lyons and everybody, a common thread that I've had throughout my career is I see all the problems and all the things that we can improve on what's happening, mm -hmm. whatever I'm a part of, whatever business company. Um, when I went to E! News, I was like, I'm not going to mention anything that I see that can improve on. Because mm -hmm. what happens is when you think too big, people get intimidated and nervous about you. Mm -hmm. They're not excited that you're bringing a new energy or new ideas. They're nervous you're going to take their job yeah. mm -hmm. or they're not needed anymore. So th when I, naively throughout mm -hmm. my life, I'd go into things like, guys, we should do this. We should do that. And thinking everyone's going to think Clinton's awesome. Right. He's got great ideas. And then I would realize as I got older, people don't want great At ideas. All. Right. So when I got on E, I was like, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to do the job. So Ben Lyons uh, one day calls me and says, hey, would you be interested in talking about music on E, mm -hmm. uh, like how I do movies? And I was like, you mean like Hollywood E? You know, because at that time we're hip hop. Like I'm, that's, right. that's a different world to us. So he's like, yeah. So I was like, sure. So I flew out there and I, I did the show. By the way, side note, mm -hmm. M was doing a show in Boston that same day I was supposed to fly to go do something mm -hmm. for Ben in New York. 
And Carolyn from, from Arista, who you may remember, Boz Boz, mm-hmm. was his girlfriend. And was like, can you, do, uh, can you speak on a panel for my, my, my boyfriend, Ben? And then Paul calls me and says, yo, M's performing at the Boston Garden. After I already said yes to the Ben thing, he's like, yo, M's going to bring you out on stage and shout you out. Oh, dang. Which is what's bigger than that in your mm-hmm. hometown, right? So I call and I say, would Ben be mad if I didn't go to that thing? How can I miss this opportunity in my hometown? Mm-hmm. So then she's like, oh my God, his heart will break. And I'm like, fuck. So I call Paul and I'm like, dude, I can't make the garden. Paul's like, all right, cool, later. Like, it's no big deal to them, <laughs> right, right? right? So I'm like, fuck, I get to miss being on stage at the Boston Garden with Eminem, right? So the day comes, I got to drive to New York in the snow to this guy I don't even fucking know his mystery panel in New York. So I go and I do it. It was like me, Kid Capri, and I think Jusky and somebody else. There's like four people in the audience. Mm-hmm. It was whack, right? <laughs> but I met Ben. A few months later, Ben calls me. Would you ever be interested in being on E! News, mm-hmm. being the music correspondent like I do movies? They mic me up. I go live on. Mics go off. Like, that was awesome. Can you come back next week? Sure. So I buy my own ticket. I come back next week. I do it for a few weeks. And then I'm like, am, am I getting a fucking job here? Like, what's happening? So I end up getting a contract there. And as I'm working there, I'm noticing the things that could be happening that are not happening because there's no one there pushing it. I'm pretty aggressive. I'm very matter. I'm from Boston. Matter of New York. Very like good. That. Matter of fact, to the point, are we doing it or not? Mm-hmm. Right? I don't beat around the bush. So the, the, uh, the president of Comcast comes down one day and he's sitting on the side of the stage watching us do the show. And I do my part and I come over the side. I'm just kind of standing there. He's standing there and he goes, well, you know, we really love having you here. And I go, well, I love being here, Ted. And I said something smart. I don't remember what, but he gave me that all too common look of, aren't you just a DJ? Mm. Which I've got a million. I'm sure you've got, aren't you just a rapper? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And then he goes, um, come up to my office when the show's over. Mm-hmm. So I go up to his office and I like literally lay on the couch. I go, Ted, what are we going to talk about, bro? Right? So, mm-hmm. so we're just kicking it. And he goes, what do you think about the show and the network? Crucial moment in my life right there. Do I tell him what I really think and maybe piss him off? Mm-hmm. Or do I just say, everything's great. I'm happy to be here. Me being the guy that can't fucking not be honest. I'm like, well, you're missing money here. You're not talking to this audience. You could be doing co-op advertising here. I just came from Hong Kong and a bunch of girls recognized me from E. You're not doing like, he's like, wow, interesting. I go, he goes, do you have any ideas? I go, yes. And he goes, what is it? And I go, well, instead of you guys chasing all of these celebrities at parties around Hollywood, why don't we build our own party that the celebrities come to Mm -hmm. and it's a destination spot for people around the world to want to go to the famous e-party because there's probably going to be celebrities there. So he goes, that's amazing. How do we do it? I was like, give me a week. Right. Talk to Sal. Sal knew Phil Shalala, who was at the Hard Rock. Within two weeks, we had the biggest party every Saturday for three years Mm -hmm. at the Hard Rock that would literally have Kanye and Paris in there at one time. Tony Braxton, Asher Roth, Neo, and Brody Jenner at one time. Like, I was literally bringing all of these worlds together in there, and I was playing hip-hop, and I was playing all the hot shit that we want to hear. Mm-hmm. And then we built Rehab, which became the first Sunday pool party right. that oh, now created yeah. all Sunday pool parties. So, you mm-hmm. know, it was it's just understanding what's needed and what the people want. And that's right. how, that's to your point of how did we bring hip-hop into Vegas, that's how. And oh, by the way, fuck that manager that was like, yo, you'll never last here. Hip hop is not wanted in Vegas. Yeah, man, in fuck Vegas. that guy. Hip hop's all over Vegas now. Fuck uh-huh. that guy. Um, th- th- around that time, you also work on an Iconic Class album. Mm-hmm. Are dropping that. Shout out to DA and Chester French, yeah. man. Yeah. I worked with Chester French, and those guys are such, such great guys. Oh, yeah, you're on one of those records we did for. Uh, the Chester French mixtape. I think it's me and Bun B on that on that together. It is you and Bun B. Yeah. Yeah. I fuck. Another me and Bun B are together. working on the album. You got some now. beats right now. Of course I got right beats. Now. I was just with the Bunster the other day. Right now. Having a Trill Burger. Yeah, man. I haven't had one oh, yet. Oh mm-hmm. man, we want Trill Burgers. Yeah. We just interviewed well, him. He's again. happy to stuff one down your throat. Yeah, he <laughs> <laughs> he he was the first guest on People's Party. Oh wow. And we just we just Bun had him one again. of the greatest guys. There's so many people that are just dicks and have like mm-hmm. cocky attitudes. Like maybe not now, now that they've kind of passed their prime and now they've come back down to earth and they're cool mm. but there's people that are like still the shit Bun B mm. you Pitbull thank you, thank you. there's so many people <laughs> everyone that, loves Pitbull dude Pitbull is like there's never a time that I, me and Pitbull are texting like me and you might be like yeah cool alright dope 
That's mm-hmm. what's up, right? Like, I'm not a texter. Yeah, at all. Yeah. <laughs> right? You don't even ta- respond half the time, right? Yeah, oh, good. It's not just, okay, yeah. great, great. Right? But like, Pipple's always like, every text, you would think it's in his signature, but it's not. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Popo. Aww. Every time, mm-hmm. no matter what you say to that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's the most humble, down-to-earth, thankful guy alive. Yeah. Speaking of famous people like Pitbull, you have a quote that I love. Famous doesn't make you great, but great makes you famous. Great can make you famous. Break that down. Well, everyone's chasing famous Mm -hmm. uh, and overlooking great. Mm -hmm. They want a shortcut because they think that famous is what brings them great. They think they're great because they're famous. Mm -hmm. And what people don't know is, you know, we all know like it takes 10 years for overnight success, right? right? But, you know, most overnight success won't last 10 years because you are focusing on becoming famous, especially today, Mm -hmm. right? Everyone wants to be famous. They think if they go viral, if my video goes viral, yo, I'm a smash. Yeah, but what what do you have next? What's your business set up? What's your structure set up? Who are you? Why do people give a fuck about you? What is it about you that they can connect to or relate to? Mm -hmm. So when I say famous doesn't make you great, but great can make you famous, all you got to do is go back and look at Walt Disney to Kobe Bryant to Oprah Winfrey, none of them cared about being famous. Mm -hmm. They cared about doing something great. Mm -hmm. And the fame was a byproduct of doing something great. So if you just worry about being great at something, like we were talking about, Mm -hmm. doing what matters to you, Mm -hmm. right? And what matters to you. At the end of the day, imagine getting famous or being successful, doing something you fucking love doing, Mm -hmm. and it's easy to do because you love it. Mm -hmm. There's no better life than that. But when you're over here struggling, trying to chase trends, hashtags, or doing what somebody else tells you to do and not chasing what you think is fucking dope because maybe it's not popping right now. Maybe everyone's not going to accept it and you won't now get the fast track to a million followers and the money you think that you deserve because you're doing these other things that are not authentic to you. Mm -hmm. Famous doesn't make you great, but great can make you famous. Just focus on being great. Yes, indeed. It's not a virtue at all. Uh, and you are someone that focused on being great. That's been my singular focus. I appreciate you writing this book about it. When I was working at Inkiru Books back in the days, I heard Karis one on the radio on, on WBAI. Mm-hmm. And he wrote a book called The Science of Rap. And he was talking about this book. And I'm like, I work at this bookstore. I need to get this book for this bookstore. And I'm like, I'm the hip hop guy at the bookstore. So I'm like, how do I get this hip hop book? into the bookstore. Mm-hmm. And so I called up the radio station. Yep. Now I'm just a KRS one fan. I'm at work and I got through and now I'm on air live talking to KRS one. Yep. And I'm like, yo, I work at this black bookstore in Brooklyn. We need copies of your book. How can we get it? He said, I was going to sell it, but I decided this knowledge has to be free. And so just send me an address. I'll send you a box of books. And so when you said you were going to give out your book for free, it brought me back to that KRS one thing. Mm-hmm. What made you decide to give the book out for free? Because I actually give a shit about people learning and winning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd kind of be a dick if I knew the blueprint to make your life better mm-hmm. and didn't share it with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why, I mean, I probably gave away 10,000 of these books for free. Wow. Um, and every time I see people, I give it away for free. But that's that's the gist of it. I just want to like, I care. Mm -hmm. I want you to win. I want you to figure out that you're in your own way. I want you to realize like, bro, you might be the problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And like, a lot of people don't have the understanding of that. Like, it's hard for people to realize, everyone can tell you what they think they're great at. No one sits here and says like, yeah, I suck a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or like, here's why I suck. Mm -hmm. Here's why my relationships don't work. Here's why I'm not winning. If they took the time to look for the reasons or the excuses and change that into learning how you can better yourself or what you might be doing wrong, those are the keys to being a better you and being successful in whatever business it is. Whether like I, I called it how to win big in the music business only because it was a Trojan horse. Because obviously if, if I'm as successful as I am in the music business and you're trying to be, you're an independent artist, you're like, I'm going to listen to this guy. He's had a lot of success. Mm-hmm. Realistically, this is how to win big at like, like Rob Durdick, Damon John, all these guys would call me and be like, why'd you just limit it to the music business? Mm-hmm. This whole book teaches you just how to win at life. Mm-hmm. But I know that if I want to give you the medicine, I got to put it in the candy that you like, mm-hmm. right? And then you, you don't even know that you're learning or becoming better by reading these things that I'm teaching here, but ultimately you're becoming a better human being by learning that, like my new book comes out uh, in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I have a new book out. It's called 10 Traits That Made Me Millions in the Music Industry, A Guide on How They Can Help You Too. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm not someone that's going to show you how to upload your music the best way, the best distributors. I'm going to teach you the traits that winners use. It's what, how I've won, how I win, and how I'll continue to win. My whole, my whole life is win, repeat, win, repeat, win, repeat. I've never lost my entire life. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that to be an asshole or pompous. It's because I apply these traits that I learned early on. Like, I'm not selling you a product. Mm-hmm. I'm not selling you a book. I'm not selling you a service. I'm selling you a feeling. And if I care enough to know the feeling that you need, then I can sell you anything. Because you might not need a fucking pen or a glass or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But you need to fulfill a feeling that you have. And everybody has a feeling to fulfill. Mm-hmm. So once you understand that about somebody, then you can sell them anything. And I'm not saying to say that as a manipulating way to be able to trick people to sell them. That comes from the foundation of caring about the feeling that people need to fulfill. So I know that before, even when we were younger, everyone wasn't trying to be a rapper. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm sure you probably, people even probably laughed at you. Fucking rapper. Right, right, right. Be, you know what I'm saying with me? Like that wasn't the end thing. Mm-hmm. Now everyone's a fucking rapper mm-hmm. or a producer or a singer right. or something to do connected to this. So what's the feeling that they're trying to get to? Mm-hmm. What's the void they're trying to fill? When you sit there and actually care and think about it and listen to them, mm-hmm. then you're, then that's what this book and all my books and the rest of the books I do for the rest of my life will be teaching you how to advance yourself personally. Well, they, I want to thank you for putting the audiobook version of it on Spotify. So if you already have Spotify, then it's free for you. Again, and I love the fact that and it's Audible and Audible that and Audible is is and my book is on Audible as well. Um, so shout out to Audible. I love the fact that it starts with the Get Familiar drop. Just like the mixtape. Right, right. Um, ladies and gentlemen. Just so you know who you're dealing with. Just so you know who you're dealing Shout with. Shout out, Pusha. Yes, indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, People's Party is proud to have Clint Sparks. Thank you. Thank you. Rep the set. Rep the set.